four degrees outside. We're having a bit of a cold snap. Let's check our temp gauge in here. Oh, it's about eight and a half degrees in our language. Uh, 43 if you're in the northern hemisphere. Quite a cool morning. It's probably about 6 a.m. too. Well, good day, Max here again. Back in the shop. So, I think when we left off the last video, I said our priority job was to get this JFMT lathe back up and running before we move on to the big Stanco milling machine, which is now before we delve any closer into our DSG lathe. So we'll take a look at that at the end of the video. So as far as the JFMT here goes, it's been quite a while since I've actually done anything to it. And I think the last video we were making a little bearing for the spline coupler here for the one of the gears on the rear of the lathe and then we made the missing cover for the way wipers so they're all installed so I went to install the cross slide had a bit of an issue with the gib strip so that, that's our mission at the first part of the video is to sort out the mission of the gib strip so I'll bring you down and I'll show you what the issue is Right, so this is Lee Hole Fox cross slide gib strip, and as you can see, she's been broken and braced. I don't know how it got broken, it was like that when I got the lathe. Um, my guess is they probably dropped it, as I just about did when we stripped the lathe. I'll just put a quick picture of that in now. Whoops, just about dropped it and broke it again. Wonder if that's how it originally got broken. And yeah, as you can see, it nearly came straight out of my hands there too. So being brazed, it's not quite straight. So let's show you. So using the lathe bed here as a reference, you can see the daylight under it at one end. We come up to the other end. Quite a There's quite a gap under it. If I lift it right up where the this end sits level, it's nearly a quarter inch, six mil gap under here. We'll turn it around the other way. We're touching on the ends and we've got a probably a couple of mil, one or probably a two mil gap there. So when we go to insert it in the cross slide. It starts to tighten up there, so we've still got 150 mil to go. Now, what I can push that in by hand and force it in, and that's the way they had the machine. So, they've obviously, they didn't, because of the other issues we have found with this machine, it's like they've bodged up a couple of things and moved the machine on. So, what that entails, because we're touching top and bottom and not evenly on the sides. If we come round, which I'll get my torch. Had to come outside to get my torch. It's about 20 past seven in the morning. The sun is not quite up yet. Mind you, it's the middle of winter here in Perth. That's why it's so cold in the morning. Anyway, back to our lathe. So what, what this does, it causes a large gap at the top and no gap at the bottom so it's actually cocked the gib strip over and if we come around to the other side um, we have a large gap at the bottom and no gap at the top so um, yeah the actual gib strip is rolling over because it's thicker in the middle so we have to correct that so we'll machine a bit off the high spots and over in the bridge port We'll just get uh, sidetracked here for a, a sec. Um, if you watch Maddie from Maddie's workshop, 
he had a bit of an issue with his um, boring head that he made and the issue was in the height of the arbor so I suggested to him that you make a bolt on one which he did it come out very well this is the one that I made for mine my R8 one now this originally came with an MT3 one but the bolt pattern was correct in the arbor but when the Chinese this is just a Chinese boring head um, they cocked up the PCD in the boring head so I, I redrilled the boring head to suit a standard well my arbor the other option you can do it if you haven't got a big and you're in the same boat and you haven't got a big lump of steel to make one is the way I originally done it now this is this um, boring head I used to put in um, Hong Fuck Wong my little um, milling machine there so this is my first one that I made and this is a really good way to do it if you haven't got a large piece of stock it's just a simple bolt-on ring so you have your arbor with its shoulder and locating area just a bolt-on ring slips over and bolts on to your boring head it's just a really quick easy way to do it without having the machine a whole or it all out of a solid lump of stock that way existing tooling that's um, you may already have some tooling with the um, correct arbor for your machine but the end may be different and it might be an unused one you can modify it yeah to suit just another option anyway let's carry on okay the first job in the bridge port over in the new shop so what we're going to be doing is taking off um, a bit in this blue area here and I'm just going to use a face mill to do that I'm going to use the edge of the insert here in the face mill so you can see our deviations a fair bit coming up to 0.2 of a millimeter nearly 0.3 there we're going over the weld back to 0 0.2 0 0.1 and back to zero there's a little grind mark there it's one on either side i don't know why they're there but that was just the indicator falling into that mark um, i'll put a hard stop in on either end too there's one uh, down there just in case we've got to put it back in uh, that way we're not dicking around too much indicating the thing back in Okay, this is a, a, a 60 degree dovetail and we've eyeballed it with the edge of the cutter Now we are appearing when I eyeballed it. We are going to be touching quite high up on the area But look this insert sits in at 45 degrees and I've got the head tilted over 15 degrees so um, that's our 60 degrees so we'll take a small cut and see what happens Okay, well that seems to have had the desired effect so I think we'll just go a fraction deeper and see uh, see what it looks like
let's take them what we wanted out it's, it's ran out faded out down there sort of fades out down here right we'll see how this lies now so we had a quarter of an inch six mil gap under there before so looking now I'd say we've probably got no more than a 20 thou half a mil gap and I can yeah that pushes down quite quite easily so that's quite good now that's a hundred percent on what it was so let's um, have a test fit So we have clearance at the top and bottom now, only just, that's what we didn't have before. So that was causing the gib to rock over and that was, that was giving us our gaps and tight spots here before. And plus we couldn't push it in like that before, we, we had like six inches hanging out. Okay, let's get our screw in position. Now, this screw's bottomed out, and our gibs all away and flush here, and I can still move the compound. And I can still move the gib. Okay, that's um, not a good thing. <laughs> Let's see how the gib's sitting on the opposite side. So you can see on the opposite side the gibbs hanging out so the adjuster is going to be hanging right out i don't know what's happened to this gib usually with this style with the slot up one end you only need one adjuster but this has one at each end i've come across it before it's not a worry okay that leaves us with two options so the two options that we have, apart from the obvious of making a new gib, which you'd shim a gib normally before you'd make a new gib. You make a new one when it's worn out and you can't do anything else with it. Okay, so we can either shim this one, or as it's only just bottoming out, this screw goes in here. Now, on a single screw application gib, this is a double screw, it has a screw at each end. This slop in here shouldn't be there. On a single screw application, this slot should be a neat fit on the adjusting screw. If it's not, what can happen is you go to move your um, cross slide, it can jam up as the gibbs are walking in and out it can get into a jammed position quite easily so i think we'll push this back in and just see where the end of the slot lays in relation to the inside of the hole and that'll give us a determination which way we go whether we shim it or we cut another slot further down here or even right in the very end of it So we'll just push this. I'm just going to tap at home. 
Farrell's little guy. Bit of a slight tap with a Okay, that's tight there. So we can actually cut the very end of our adjuster. We'll go around the other side. Yeah, I've got a lot hanging out here. Just tap it out so it's flush. I think we're going to go that way. I think. Because I'm going to have to trim, this is where you've got to stop and think for a minute. I'll show you around the other side. I think we're going to cut the slot just in from the end. That's a neat fit on there. Now, let me bring you around the other side. We'll just poke this back in. So we've got this overhanging here now. Now, that gives us another two options. One is to cut the end of that off, um, which I'm never a fan of, as it really reduces the life of the gib. So now, the way to take care of that, just move it, oops, just to push, push that back up, we'll go around the other side. So that's flush now. And our slot's got a way to go before it bottoms out against the base of the hole in there. So that brings to the thought of shimming the gib. In this case, to me, this is possibly a better option than cutting another notch in here and shortening the gib up. So, let me see what shims we've got. And one other very important point you have to consider, because I've been caught out with this before, is your way wiper in relation to where the gib sits in the front. So, the way wiper goes up like that. So you cannot afford to have the gib poking past this casting any more than what it is. So, in actual fact, it needs to sit up inside a little bit to allow for future adjustment. Now, if we go to the rear. So, in the rear, it looks like it can hang out fine all day long without any dramas, as the wiper sits above it. It's just a single strip top cover wiper. I'll have to verify that in the parts book because this is all only bit I don't have any other bits for this but yeah I will check the um, parts book as it was so long ago when I pulled this apart so we can have some hanging out the back and we cannot have anything hanging out the front let me go and dig up some shims just to look out the side door of the shop nice day for the middle of winter Oh, well, let's um, go and find some shim stock and cut these shims. So I've got, I've got some um, shim stock. It comes in a packet 12 inches long, 3 inches wide, 1.5 thou up to 10 thou. It's old stock, this. <laughs> Still in, in imperial sizes. So yeah, it's just a thin sheet like that. I've cut a little piece off the end. I'm just going to stick it in, just the end. I just want to see if 
just by hand like that and I want to see how much gib protrudes out the other side So looking there, we're not far off flush. So it's looking like we'll need a bit thicker than 10 thou. So I might have to double it up and put in probably a 6 thou shim behind it. We'll see how that goes. But let's cut our 10 thou ones out first and we'll put them in. Okay, that's our first one, so I'll make another one the same. Right, we've cut our shims. Now, I realise it is slightly unorthodox having to cut two shims, but this was the longest shim stock that I had. It does leave a um, slight gap in the middle. It's not much, it's probably only about 60 millimetres. So I don't think that's going to be detrimental. Now, on the one end, what we do is we fold a little lip over so that the adjuster screw capsulates Get back on there. Get on there, you thing. <laughs> Now let's get the adjusting screw, which is here. So the adjusting screw traps the shim on this end. And the other end where we have the slot, what we do is just cut out and fold a little tab over so it's capsulated into the slot. That way the shims can't move in and out, they can't walk around in there. So let's have a trial fit up, shall we? Plenty of lube. You know the story, eh, Ralphie? Okay. So the first one is one with the um, folded end. And of course, the second one is the one with our notched end. We hold a screw in the end so our shim doesn't walk out.
Okay, we're in. We'll see how the other end's sitting. So there's the end of our shim there, and this edge here is the flush face. So it's possible we're going to have to put another 5 thou shim behind the slot. Um, let's put this screw in. We'll see if we can get adjust, adjust it up and see how it feels. It's getting tight there. Feels nice and even. But, little problem here. Let's swing it down. As you can see, our adjusting screw is sticking out. So, you can see the imprint on the way wiper before where the adjusting screw was contacting the, the wiper so and that's the adjustment on that at the moment is good so I think what we're going to have to do is put another possibly five thou behind those shims so it's looking like we need a 15 thou shim which I don't have. However, uh, we've got a four and a six. I think I'll go for a six and we'll double up the shims. Um, one thing doubling up the shims like this, as far as I'm concerned, it's not really recommended practice, but if that's what you have to do, that's what you have to do. I'll have a, um, another quick search around to make sure I do not have anything which is 15 thou thick, which would be the ideal solution. Other than that, yeah, I'll just cut out another couple of shims and we'll have another crack at it. So the six thou ones that I cut out were too thick, so I've made a pair of three thou ones and they seem to be sitting in quite good. So, yeah, I would have liked to have seen this gib in here, probably in another quarter of an inch. But, then we'll be running into trouble up the other end. So you can see now we've got quarter of an inch of travel. That gib can be adjusted up before it bottoms out on the way wiper just here. When the wiper's installed. So, yeah, we are hanging out at the back probably 20 millimeters I would have liked to have seen that in a bit further as I said but it's going to interfere out here and I'm not cutting the gib down that's a surefire way to reduce the life of it so right let's get on to this on our cross slide lead screw this is the arrangement for taking the backlash out so it has this center portion here which gets pulled up by this cap screw which would mount in this hole so with it pulled all the way up once it becomes flush with these two surfaces there's no more adjustment left so I'm just going to put this in the milling machine we'll just take 
probably two mil off this top surface and that'll give us plenty of future adjustment. Okay, that should do it. Hong Fuck Wong here, making parts for his Chinese brother, Li Ho Fook. <laughs> uh, it's been a handy machine to have around, the little Zay 7045, just for these little quick little bits you need to do. Okay, now you can see we've got some adjustment here for the spreader come up before it hits flush level with the two nuts so yeah as this comes up it spreads the two nuts apart and takes up the backlash right we're all oiled up ready to go now this shaft is a bit different than your normal lathe cross slide screw it's a two-piece screw so it has a keyway in there and you might be able to see if I get my torch you look down that hole, you can just see the end of the shaft from the hand wheel. Okay, that, that shaft has a captured um, key in it, which lines with this key here. This allows this whole shaft assembly to slide coupled with the top part of the cross slide. It enables it, them to slide in and out independently of the hand wheel control that's because this end here gets attached to the taper turning attachment which we'll go through next probably we'll do that in a separate video because it's um, a bit quite a bit involved with that so we'll get this all mounted up now it'll be a jiggle to get in to line this key up but fingers crossed it's just a matter of Coming in from underneath, get our nut in position. We'll just put one screw in to hold it finger tight for now. So what we've got to make sure that the keyway in the other part is in the 12 o'clock position. And this keyway here, which I can see through the hole, is also in the 12 o'clock position. Now hopefully with a small amount of jiggery, we can make the two couple up. That's it, we're in. okay right so once the taper turning attachment is in place it'll come down here and lock onto this end of the lead screw that will secure the lead screw and then we'll be able to use the hand wheel to wind the cross slide in and out so yeah the taper turning attachment will do that on the next video well that's all we've got time for at the moment um, like the taper turning attachment since we removed it from the lathe I haven't touched it so I've got to strip it down clean it up and we'll video its reassembly and fitment onto the machine here um, yeah I was hoping to get 
Well, I can do that next time. The compound slide is all ready. We've already been through that, so that's ready to bolt straight on. Why don't we just take a wander down the other end of the shop and have a look, quick sneak peek at the new acquisition for the shop. You're staring down the barrel at one of the early queens of British machining. It's enough to make a man stop in his tracks and just make him point and grunt. Delightful, sexy, gorgeous. Dean Smith and Grace, Keeley, England. <laughs> so let's take a wander around and see what we're dealing with here. So this machine here, I've thrown it a well-deserved lifeline. Now, uh, a good friend of mine picked this machine up a couple of years ago. Um, it was in a pretty sad state then. Here's a photo of it when my friend picked it up. Okay, so he had full intentions of um, cleaning, cleaning it all up and seeing if he could use it in his workshop. He has a fabrication shop. So there's a bit of a story to it. And I had a look at it when he first picked it up. It was still in its um, colors, wasn't painted gray. The machine is X Midland Railway Workshops, which is just down the road. Now, after the machine left the railway workshops, when all of the machines were stripped out of there a long time ago, it ended up at a property just up the road from here. So, your friend got onto it, took the machine back to his workshop, and I went down and had a look over it for him, and I was quite surprised at the condition of it. So, he had someone in to wet blast just the trip uh, the chip tray i said to him don't paint it just clear coat the thing and leave all its original railway workshop patina on it so long story short it ended up getting uh, the whole machine got wet blasted so my friend then painted it and it is as we see it now lucky they did a really good job and all the irreplaceable um, name plates and tags on the machine have not been damaged in any way so that's good so i knew this machine was coming up for a fair while and i had totally dismissed it it took a lot of um thinking i just just i had to get it out of my head from 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 getting hold of it because I, i'm quite full up here so I was at my friend's fab shop to get some um, other bits done for myself and he said this DSG it has to go it might even be going for scrap well that flicked the switch in my head as soon as he mentioned scrap I said to him there's no way you're scrapping this machine I will take it off your hands which I, prom <laughs> which I promptly did so here it is uh, let's have a walk around it will be a future project after we've got the JFMT up and running and the big Stanco milling machine up and running so let's show you what we're dealing with so as you can see she's a she's an old girl this one old flatbed lathe has a decent size three and five eight inch spindle bore the through bore six foot eight inch bed length of flatbed machine it's in quite good condition for its age talking about well its age i don't really know what year this is there's 
well, I couldn't really find to any information apart from like what's already out there, which is the same as what I've got for the handbook on the lathe. But what I could find, it seemed to me like DSG went to a direct drive mounted motor, um, I think around about 1940. So if we look at a picture in this book here, So they have the motor directly mounted on the back. Okay, so this is quite likely a slightly later model one than my one, as it looks like an isolator switch here. And the pump and all that for the um, headstock is internal. So, we swing around to this one. The headstock oiling pump is external. So in the early days of Dean Smith and Grace, as I from what I can find out, they were open to changing the arrangement of the machine slightly for the customer to suit the customer's needs. Look, obviously that changed later on. So we're not sure what's actually gone on here. There's this drive um, unit here. Now, I don't. I think it's 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 after the line shaft era. It has to be, I think, because it's got all its electric switches here for the electric motor. So it possibly was optioned, yeah, you, you just put a remote mount motor. Now the motor for this machine is on a bit of a hinky frame that, that bolts on here. This is the motor. It's a 10 horsepower motor. Name tag says it was made here in Perth, Western Australia. Now this would have been a long time ago because we don't make stuff over here anymore. And like the, the frame, it's a bit of a hinky homemade frame. Probably made in, the, well, well, it was made in the railway workshops. So that leads me to believe, is this ex drive extension early DSG? Or was this one that they cast themselves in the workshops as they did that sort of thing? <coughs> Cheers, me. So over its years, the machine's copped a, a bit of damage. There's a lot of breakages in some of the castings here. So I do have a lot of the bits and pieces for the castings. So we'll show you um, on the bench over in a minute. We do have a um, fair bit of cast iron welding to do. <clears throat> so I, I'd, I'd really like to go through this machine and bring it right up to scratch. Um, how far I go determines will be determined by when I measure up the bed and just check what wear or what wear isn't in the bed. <clears throat> oh, excuse me. And same with the spindle. It's a plain bearing spindle machine. So we'll do some measurements here as well. And that will like determine how far we go. But hopefully I'd really like to see this machine back in really good condition and use it in my shop. So the machine, it's a 17 and a half inch swing machine. It has a threaded spindle plus the, this driving flange. So this is to mount the chuck on. It came with a, a really good 20 inch four jaw chuck with no wear in it whatsoever. So yeah, 10 horsepower motor. The model of the lathe is a 4BN. Top spindle speed, a whacking 418 RPM. So we'll actually put, when we got the motor coupled back up, we'll put a taco on and just check to see if the speeds are true to the plate being um, not 
we don't know what if the the pulley size on the motors are correct for those speeds or not um, as far as making the thing go faster um, I wouldn't recommend it not with plain spindle bearings if that's what DSG had for the max speed well, that's what it will keep but we'll, we'll check it with a taco so all the electrics on the machine um, have all been checked out um, I could put that motor on plug this thing in and switch it on so the electrics have been done so there's nothing um, I have to do there so yeah that's what it should look like and that's what I'm going to be hopefully aiming for with the, this a restoration so the rest of the machine we have on the bench here I mean everything seems in really good condition there's only five thou backlash in the compound I think there's about 30 thou yeah 30 thou backlash here it, uh, it all seems in really good conditions from um, just a casual quick look over so obviously this will all get stripped down and gone through same with the apron here the lead screw half nuts all look in excellent condition even the wear on the drive pinion there's not there's no wear in it so it's had a bit of a bingle at some stage in its life that's been welded um, the bra the bronze feed nut feed drive it's all in really good condition which is a solid machine here's the tail stock so that for a number four morse taper that's a three and a half inch diameter quill that's huge that's solid they don't come any more solid than that solid as a rock of gibraltar so we've got yeah a lot of stuff to go through we've got a lot of handle repairs to do as most of the handles have been broken i actually think this lathe has fallen over at some stage and been bumped into a few times <laughs> so a bit, bit more cast iron repairing to be done there's the bits off that other bit on the coolant drain of course the the, the covers for the engine oil pump all the badging is all in really good condition still which is surprising and check this sexy beast out here this is the coolant spout that's like a inch solid bar all the brass work proper spout so yeah really nice inside the headstock decent proper size gears now all these gears are ground gears and the oil drain or the oil feed tubes going to everywhere everything in here is in really good condition but there is a little bit of wear on that last gear down there but nothing that i'm too concerned about So it has a lead screw reverse lever here. This reverses your feeds as well. Now, this is supposed to be set up for when you're screw cutting metric threads, as this machine doesn't have a spindle reverse. You can reverse the direction of your lead screw without depitching your thread to come back for another cut. But there's no slop or anything in any of these gear change levers everything's real, really nice and like you shift the gears one finger 
you know, effortlessly. Well, yeah, I think we'll button up this one here. So, yeah, no, this will be a really interesting project, this one, when we get to it. <laughs> so, anyway, cheers. Thanks for watching, and uh, yeah, we'll see you in the next video.